full night. We welcome all of your warm bodies and warm hearts and <laughs> spirits of divine nature. And we are happy that you're here on this first opportunity to do this and just have this program. And to the uh, chairman of the Martin Luther King Planning Commission slash president of the SCLC from Greater New Orleans, and to all of the panelists that are gathered here, we greet you. Let us now pray. <clears throat> the Lord God, we come giving you thanks. Thank you. It's been a long journey for all of us being black and being in this country. Yep, sir. But thank God for Martin Luther King. Thank God for all of the unsung heroes. Elizabeth Hines, Gretchen, that 12 years old was beaten in Mississippi, Jackson, because she wanted to go to a restaurant and the other facility was broke. And someone <laughs> drug her out and beat her. Her parents became civil rights advocates and workers because of her death. We thank you, Lord, for all of us who are here. And let us remember as long as one child is dying in this country, in this city, the challenge of civil rights is not over. We still have to fight the fight and win the battle. With your help, Lord, give us the strength and the ability to do so. And Lord, we ask that you bless this gathering, bless all those who will speak, bless their homes and families far and near, and bless those who are yet to come. In Christ we pray, amen. Amen. Now, turn back over to our chairperson. Thank you. You know, prayer is good in any season. Yes. Absolutely. For any reason. Yes, sir. We can't say enough prayer. Some years ago, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad began to awaken us, he told us that we need to do for ourselves. If they can get fish from the sea, we can get fish from the sea. If they can get milk from cows, we can get milk from cows. Well. And I'm saying this as a way of introducing our call to prayer. We have with us Brother Lawrence Muhammad of Mosque 46. Amen. <clears throat> Thank everyone for inviting us and allowing us to be here and to participate in something that's so wonderful and so great, you know, and it's an honor to be among all of you. And the prayer that I would like to say is a prayer that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad gave to us. And when you hear the words of this prayer, you will know that this prayer was designed specifically for us. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. Oh Allah, we seek your refuge from anxiety and grief. I seek thy refuge from lack of strength and laziness. I seek thy refuge from cowardice and niggardliness. I seek thy refuge from being overpowered by death and the oppression of men. Oh Allah, suffice thy us <coughs> with what is lawful to keep us away from what is prohibited. And with your grace, make us free from want of anything that's beside you. Yes, sir. And O oh Allah, we beseech your help, and we ask for your mercy. For we believe in you, and we trust in you for all that we need. We are helpless in your cause with your apostle. Please grant to us success. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Muhammad. We are indeed honored to have with us, as mentioned earlier, not only the chairman of the Martin Luther King Holiday Planning Commission, but also the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, may I introduce to some and present to others the Reverend Dr. Norwood Thompson. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Facilitator, for allowing us to come here. Assalamu alaikum, Abari Ghani. How are everybody doing this afternoon? 
It is a pleasure to be here, and I, I greet you on behalf of the Martin Luther King Federal Holiday Commission, all the commission members present here tonight. What a joy to come. And I want to thank our facilitator, our chairman of this educational series. It's the start of something great that will be happening from here on out for the, uh, for the betterment of our city. And once again, I greet you on behalf of my Lord and Savior. And as I come, I would be remiss again if I did not inject the name of Dr. Elliot C. Willard, who was an educator here in the city of New Orleans. And this program really is dedicated to what's in tonight also. Thank you, Mr. Facilitator. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's all right to clap. <laughs> um, we have with us today Uh, one who, and I didn't really know this, that they actually had one of the first African-American businesses on Canal Street. I didn't know that. Uh, without any further ado, I'm going to bring up uh, Reverend Helena Wright Butler to read to us the uh, bio of Doc Willard. Our Lord and Savior Jesus, the risen Christ. Uh, I am not going to read his Bible. I will just tell you some things about Dr. Willard. Uh, in that his Bible is here, and I don't want to insult your intelligence by trying to read this to you. But let me tell you this. If we note that he was uh, born in 1931. That was during the Jim Crow time, lynching, white citizen concept. All that bad stuff was going on. This was the period in which he was born. He was born to a large family, and he in turn had a larger family. <laughs> We'd like to also to say about Dr. Wood. He was God-fearing. His parents brought him up in the church, and he was spiritually filled. Yes. He was an excellent student. He ran track, he played ball, and he was excellent in all of those things. He was an educator, a real educator. And as I look, um, and his biography that's a little bit more extensive than this. He was the principal of one of the African American schools. It was called Colored Schools then. Some of you don't remember that. You're not old enough. I think there are three people in here that might remember that. Colored schools. <laughs> there was a time when there was one high school in the world, McDonald 35. And finally, we got another high school, which was Booker T. Washington. But it was an industrial school. It was a good school. And Dr. Willard, he taught at that school. He also taught at St. Augustine. And he taught at Clark. I see him all the time mentioned about his students at Clark. But he was a teacher at Clark High School. Booker T. Washington is no longer here. Am I right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Clark has been renamed to uh, Charter School. It's not a public school. Uh, it's a public school, but it's not the way it was. During that time, St. Augustine is still there in good shape. He was a humanitarian. He loved the people. He looked out for the people. He was a member of organizations that cared about people. I remember he receiving accolades for his humanitarian efforts. 
He was also a politician. He ran for office and he won. He was on the school board for quite many years. I would say that there is much we could say about Dr. Elliot Cornelius Willard Sr. It's your time, no your patient will permit me to say all there is to say about that great man. May God bless you for it. We're going to give you a brief history of civil disobedience and civil rights. A brief history of civil disobedience and civil rights. And of course, this is by the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 2013 Education Series. What do you think about when you hear the phrase civil disobedience? Some of the images that come to mind when we think about civil rights, civil disobedience. <clears throat> you might be surprised to learn that the struggle for civil rights and civil disobedience actually did not originate with African Americans. <clears throat> actually, it didn't even originate in the United States of America. Civil disobedience defined, and usually when you go to a, uh, a presentation, uh, an academic presentation, there's always a definition, so I always give you a definition. So defined is basically the refusal to obey civil laws in an effort to <clears throat> induce change. Okay. Let's take a look back in terms of history where civil disobedience actually started erupting. We can go back to the Torah. The Torah tells us, I'm talking about the Old Testament, I know all everybody in here knows that. But the Torah tells us that midwives disobeyed Pharaoh and refused to kill babies born to Hebrew. As a consequence, the king gave the order to throw all the babies in the Nile. Well, the parents of Moses decided to go a little further, that they would hide their child. And uh, we know the story of Moses and what happened. They later placed him in a basket in the Nile. The New Testament asserts that when Peter and John were commanded by the government not to preach the gospel, their response was, we must obey God rather than men. Yes. Civil disobedience. <laughs> Socrates. Socrates tells us that the law should be accepted and followed, but not just because they're laws basically because it's the right thing to do if the laws are righteous laws. Because we have to remember that everything that Hitler did was legal. The story of Perseus. Now, uh, those of you who like movies and stuff, y'all remember the Clash of the Titans, but it goes way beyond that. <laughs> it goes way beyond that. This is actually, he did not want the gods, those people who were in Mount Olympus, he did not want them to run their lives. He said that man can do what man needs to be done for man. Civil disobedience. Getting closer to home, perhaps you recall, uh, Christmas Adams. Yes. An escaped slave. Who was an escaped slave. And fortunately, Fortunately, and I, don't, I don't know if you all really know the history, and I, I know I have a couple <coughs> historians in here, but they were actually sitting in a bar talking. And while they were talking, he said, you know what, we need to do something. We need to actually go out and fight. And it was a whole group of them with pitchforks and, and, and sticks and 
basically forming tubes. They went out on the street marching, and when they turned the corner, they saw something they didn't expect. It was a whole troop of British soldiers. And they were actually very afraid because they didn't know what was going on. And the people were afraid and they were a little intoxicated. Someone from the back, I'm told, from one of my old professors, threw a stick. And it hit a soldier, and as he fell, he shot. Well, the soldiers didn't know where the bullet came from. So they just started shooting. And as you know, uh, Christmas Island was the first to fall. Yes. Civil disobedience. The Boston Tea Party, we all are familiar with basically what happened. I see a young man here in school. He probably, if I ask him to stand up, he probably can tell us the whole history of the Boston Tea Party. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But basically, it was civil, an act of civil disobedience. Thomas Jefferson, and I like this, because we really don't talk about Thomas Jefferson and what he said, and the real meaning of what they did, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive, whenever any form of government becomes destructive, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government. Now, all right, now, I, I, I know we have a lot of City Hall people in here, so I shh. You didn't say that. <laughs> oh, Master, you're going to get us in trouble. <laughs> That's good. That's good. All right. Um, Henry David Thoreau. Uh, again, and he actually wrote uh, what do you call the back those back then the thesis with a paper on civil disobedience. Uh, it was important that he said, again, the whole meaning is, was not to, not to obey a law just because it's a law, unless it's a righteous law. And I mentioned about history, remember slavery. That was legal. It was a law. Civil disobedience. Just keep rolling. Contemporary examples include, of course, Gandhi in India, uh, in South Africa with uh, uh, ANC, Nelson Mandela. Uh, just recently in Egypt, when I say recently, within the last several years. Uh, in Thailand, uh, US abolition of slavery, and the women's suffrage union, and I hope that in the future we'll do something specifically on females, on women, in the struggle for civil rights. Uh, maybe uh, Reverend Galaz will help us get that together. Okay, at this point we've seen the concept of civil disobedience. Uh, let's take a look at um, uh, civil rights. 1776, we have a document, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, I probably shouldn't say this since we're on a film, but they really mean all white men. So maybe we'll edit that out later. No, that's fine. But it's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. And I, I'm, I'm taught that the truth is good in any season. That's right. That's right. Remember I told you about, you know, you always have these definitions, so we have to do definitions of things. And basically we're talking about rights that are guaranteed, that are fundamental. Not privileges, we're talking about rights of individuals. Uh, any lawyers in the <coughs> Okay, well basically we're talking about enforceable rights. Uh, the express freedom of assembly, the expression, the right to vote. I was talking to my son about that the other day about voting. Uh, he's a senior at Franklin High, and I said, we really, as a people, really just began to vote in 64. Now, there were pockets of places where people were voting, but as a country, it was only legal in about, was it 64 or 65? 65? 65? 65? Okay, let's go a little further. And that's another thing we'll be doing on voting. The 13th Amendment. We always celebrate, as a people, we always celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation. All right. But did you know that it was only good for 100 days? All right. It was set to expire. And it's really funny because President Lincoln, there was something called War Acts. Um, war acts by individuals who, are, who were in power, they were able to do certain things. And quite frankly, he didn't know that he could do it, but he did it. And uh, Orleans Parish, by the way, was one of the parishes that was exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation. 
So maybe technically we might still be slaves. No, I'm not. Ah. <laughs> that's, that's what's going on. <laughs> the Thirteenth Amendment was really important because of. The Emancipation Proclamation actually was only supposed to be in effect until the end of the Civil War. Hopefully that we would win, the North that is. Uh, but we needed the 13th Amendment to become a part of the Constitution. And that way it applied to everyone from that point on. So that's really what we should be celebrating, the 13th Amendment. Let's go a little further. <laughs> the 14th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, very important. It gave us equal protection under the law. Equal protection under the law. That's very, very important. Just keep pressing. We're doing civil rights, we're talking about the freedom of speech, the freedom of press, freedom of assembly freedom of expression, the right to vote, uh, freedom from involuntary servitude, mm -hmm. and the right to equality in public places. Unfortunately, <coughs> unfortunately, not every American was, in, was able to exercise uh, their freedoms. So the question then, who advocated or who advocates for those who cannot advocate for themselves. Now normally I'd have a little prize or a t-shirt or something I'd ask <laughs> if anybody can name all of those different uh, organizations. Go ahead, uh, one more please. Some of the buttons that we, we would wear. A couple <coughs> of pins worn. We call black Muslims. Now we say Nation of Islam. Yes. Black Panthers. We had other black power groups. Uh, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Southern <coughs> Christian Leadership Conference, A. Philip Randolph Institute, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee when we had the sit-ins, and I think we had a couple of folks in uh, of our panelists who participated in that, those activities, um, and of course the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The purpose of this this evening, this presentation, is to let, and it's actually for young people, is to let them know that we stand on the shoulders of others. That the streets that we travel down were paved by someone that came before us. The buildings that we entered were built by someone that came before us, and the doors that we opened were opened by someone that came before us. Let us not forget. Do you think that at this time in our lives that they already have something in City Hall indicating that black people were there? I think that they should have something in City Hall and everywhere. But the problem is we can't wait on the White House or the Governor's House or the Mayor's House. It has to come from your house and my house and your house if we want something to change, if we want something to happen. Okay. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you.